So now I would like to uh, call Mr. Ferdinando Miachi oh, from the Department of Economics and Management of the University of Padova, or Padova, yes, Padova. Padova in Italy. He will uh, present the, the paper, Acquisitive and Productive Capital and Kaus Menger Zur Thierry des Capitals. I don't know how to talk in German, so sorry <laughs> about my German. Okay. Have a good time, Mr. Now Ferdinando. You see the, the title is exact over there. <clears throat> well, this is an article that has never been totally translated into English. And so in order to understand it, you want uh, has to uh, know one of the two different languages into which um, a, tra um, a transaction is available. One is Spanish and the other is Italian. Um, the Tour Theorie des Capitals uh, is uh, approximately 48 pages long. It was published in Jarbuk of National Economy and Statistics in 1888. And it was reprinted again in German in uh, uh, the collected works of Karl Menger uh, by the London School of Economics in 1935. Since then, uh, no further translation has been available. The initial two partial translations are one in French, Contribution à la théorie du capital, uh, which was published in Revue d'économie politique in the same year in which uh, Menger's uh, article was published, namely in 1888. The other partial translation is in English, and it's titled Karl Menger, Contribution to the Theory of Capital, Section 5, and was published in Journal of Institutional Economics in 2020, translated by Professor Brown. The total translations are one in, in Spanish entitled Sobre la Teoria del Capital and was published in Processos de Mercado in 2007. The Italian translations too are Per una Teoria del Capital was published in a book containing different uh, papers published, uh, Austrian, on Austrian economics published in 1983, and uh, the other one is published in a book uh, that, uh, uh, that has been uh, published in 2018. Uh, I have been able to uh, prepare an article on this, uh, um, on this essay for two reasons. First, in order to understand why it has never been translated into English, and why it is so rarely cited, and perhaps never quoted, in uh, uh, neo-Austrian publications. And then I wanted to understand the role, why it was like, this, why it, it was not translated, perhaps uh, um, as a result of what the, the neo-Austrian economists also thought of it, as if it did not represent exactly or completely the Austrian tradition in economic theory. But I'm not sure about that. Um, and so I have decided to focus on it, if only because I had already published a number of articles on the theory of capital, and uh, I could uh, write the paper that I have presented today, I'm going to present today, because I started from the Italian translations of it. And there is a problem here in the sense that the, the words used by Menger are not translate, exactly translatable into Italian or into English. There are some words that have a double meaning, and uh, the most important of which is Vermögen, which, is, which has already been uh, uh, discussed in the literature concerning uh, the exact translation that it would require into English in the first place, because English has the term capital, which means two things completely different. I will focus on them in a while. And therefore, there are even uh, problems like this that have uh, 
that have concerned the translation or the discussion or the utilization of this essay in the following literature. Uh, how can I move to the other slide? What can I do to move to the second slide? I don't know, maybe someone from the organization. I don't want to destroy everything. <laughs> second one. Okay, I know, again. You see, these are, which, which is one? This one, excuse me? Uh, I have not seen which one you used. This one? This one. This one, okay. Well, this is a summary of what I have just said concerning the different translations, partial translations or total translations of that, of Menger's essay. What is most important to remember is that uh, uh, the English translation uh, uh, concerns just the final section of that uh, essay, section five, about which more later. For those of you who are not familiar with the essay, I have prepared this uh, index concerning the five sections into which the paper is uh, subdivided. Um, I, here I cannot dwell on each word of these titles, I would like to summarize, briefly summarize, the difference, when after reading it, between uh, the first four sections on the one end and the final section five on the other, in the sense that the initial four sections contain uh, uh, Menger's critique of what he regarded and what was actually the prevailing theory of capital in his times. Whereas the final section five um, contains its uh, defense and proposal of a concept of capital, which he calls the, the real begriff this capital, where the real means uh, popular rather than real for an English direct translation of that term, or a realistic perhaps than, uh, re than real. I will, ex I will explain why in a while. My paper is structured as follows. Um, section one is about Menger's three concepts of capital, actually, because uh, the concept that he defends uh, in uh, the final section, in section four of his, excuse me, in section uh, five of his work um, is just one of the three concepts that can be uh, singled out in his uh, uh, publications, particularly in his principles. In section two of my paper, I focus instead on the initial comments, uh, restricted comments and not detailed comments, of, the, of uh, uh, Menger's uh, uh, the concept and theory of capital by Bernbauer first, Hayek secondly, and Stiegler thirdly. Um, but I, I have no time, I believe, to uh, focus on the details of these uh, uh, objections or comments, mostly with regard particularly to Bernbauer and Hayek, favorable to that essay not so much with regard to Stiegler. Then section three is about Menger's reaction to what is the most important uh, subject of my paper and of this presentation, which is the technical conception of capital as uh, uh, contrasted with the economic, I'm using his, his terms, technical economic conception of capital, more about this about the meaning of these two terms in a while. And finally, section four is focused uh, to actually the uh, final um, section of, uh, um, of Menger's uh, paper, and particularly to, on the concept of the real begriff, the capitals, where I repeat, real does not mean real but realistic in particular, by which he means in that particular um, essay, uh, um, chapter, which is the final chapter, he means uh, uh, money capital. But this is not the only one concept, in my view, uh, adopted by 
uh, Menga. This is the summary of uh, the whole, uh, uh, um, of, of all the arguments that I use in order to summarize first and to criticize secondly um, uh, um, Menger's uh, um, theory of capital, which is, let me go forward again, I oh, know, back, back. Well, let me introduce this by focusing on the two terms, acquisitive and productive capital, that I have used in the title. Behind these two adjectives um, is, uh, the, uh, are the criticisms and interpretations that may be made, criticisms made by uh, Menger, and the interpretations that have been made short interpretations that have been made so far about the whole issue. Uh, speaking in, uh, uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, Menger's own uh, language, um, he um, also calls this uh, acquisitive and productive capital, but with his adjective, he means capital from the acquisitive standpoint or from the technical standpoint, and his argument, implicit argument, because he often does not mention the names of the authors that he is criticizing, uh, with his terms, he means, uh, his, his own terms, uh, in te in, 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 instead of using acquisitive, he, say, he uses the term economic. And instead of using productive, he uses the term technical. So that he, his all, uh, all his comments about his essay, um, not within his essay, concern two different uh, ways of dealing with capital, which he refers actually to Ben Bavak in the first place, against Ben Bavak in the first place, and against Adam Smith in the second place. With the only difference that he, he fails to mention the name of Bavark except in two footnotes and for a slightly different reason than the, the main reason uh, according to which uh, Men, uh, ben Baver deserves to be criticized by Menger uh, with regards to the distinction between acquisitive and productive capital. And then uh, against Smith, uh, on which he uh, devotes uh, the third um, section, yes, the third section of his paper, the whole of it has been written having Smith in mind, but not only having him in mind, but also citing and quoting it. And I should uh, point out, citing rather than quoting, in the sense that you read it, you find a set of arguments against Smith which are not supported by quotations against which these criticisms are uh, leveled. And this is the reason why I criticize uh, something uh, within the way in which Menger criticizes Adam Smith, in the sense that in Adam Smith's text, it is possible to find passages and uh, structures of thought that uh, go against the interpretation provided by Menger. More about this later if I have time enough to do it. So uh, <laughs> let me present now the contents of my paper which are based on, or they consist of uh, four sections. As explained before. This is the summary of my arguments within these four sections. Section one is just a, a presentation of uh, Menger's prevailing concepts uh, of capital, which are um, simply these money capital first, capital value secondly, but, and very briefly used by him in his, uh, even in his principles, and capital goods, as, which is the most popular um, uh, concept of capital adopted by uh, Menger, 
uh, in the sense of uh, what you is very familiar, I suppose, to you, namely uh, goods uh, of uh, higher and higher orders. Uh, if you read uh, with some attention the lines where he presents uh, this view of goods as goods of higher and higher order, you will realize that he has in mind, and his language also is uh, structured in such a way, that these goods are regarded by him as owned by individuals. And this is the strategic point of view, or the strategic approach to the theory of capital, in my view, that uh, can be found uh, everywhere in uh, Menger's uh, system of thought. In the sense that, uh, starting from Ben Bavark, uh, one should distinguish, but also from Adam Smith, you are, should make a distinction that is ignored by Menger between uh, the two concepts of capital. The concept of capital from an individual point of view and the concept of capital from a social point of view. The, second, the latter one being the consequence of the previous one in the sense that the individuals decide whether or not to save, whether or not to create capital, whether or not to invest capital in one direction or in another. But from the social point of view, the capital that is so created is only the capital that is needed in order to produce national revenue. That is a flow of final goods that are available only because different forms of capital have been created yesterday or last year or many years ago by individuals, each of whom was interested in his own interest in doing that and in the profit resulting from the creation of capital, which is something that is of no interest when it comes to the theory of capital from the social point of view, because in that case, the capital is taken into consideration, just consists of capital goods existing there, uh, regardless who is the owner of them, and uh, used the, and uh, combined with living labor, as Marx would call it, living labor, in order to produce either further capital goods or even better, and finally, final consumption goods. Uh, now, I'm sorry, as I was saying before, I have no time to go forward, but uh, um, the uh, essential distinction that is worth making here is the distinction between the technical, as it is called by Menger in Appendix C, titled The Concept of Capital, distinction between the technical and the economic point of view. And uh, what is most important is that the technical point of view is the one that, according to him, was uh, focused upon and developed by Ben Bavark and Adam Smith, according to the uh, uh, indirect methods of production, or roundabout way methods of production. And uh, it remains to be seen to what extent this applies, if not to Ben Bavark, to Adam Smith himself, because if you focus on chapter one, book two of the Wealth of Nations, then, and I'm wondering why Menger neglects that chapter, you find that uh, the theory of capital is uh, introduced by uh, Smith in book two, which is entirely devoted to the accumulation of capital. It is introduced by distinguishing between capital from the point of view of an individual, namely of its individual owner, and capital from the point of view of the old society. And in the, with regard to capital also, the profit resulting from the one and profit resulting from the other, okay, it being understood what had been uh, made clear 10 years before Smith wrote his book, namely uh, the distinction between relative profit and positive profit, where, by which positive profit means an increase in national revenue, regardless of, of who appropriates it, whereas relative profit is an increase in individual income. However, uh, the mechanism by which it is increased uh, is created, and this mechanism may not coincide with the mechanism needed for increasing national revenue. I have many other things to uh, <laughs> present and many other comments to make on Menger's uh, essay, 
And on the literature that uh, was developed about it, particularly by Ben Bavert, uh, rather than, and by a few um, contemporary uh, economists, uh, but uh, there is no time enough to uh, continue. Thank you very much. Thank you.